Well, this weekend was the 15th anniversary of September 11th. Of course, that's been overshadowed by Hillary's collapse in the poll, followed by her physical collapse and the collapse of the mainstream media as people realize what a lying narrative they have been participating in. And, of course, the panic at the DNC as to what they're going to do with Hillary's collapse, with her health situation. All that has overshadowed September 11th. And we're going to talk about that in today's program. We're going to talk about the updates to that. We're going to talk about the possibilities that they might remove her. Who, How likely is that? Who would they put in her place? But before we do, let's go back to what really yesterday was about. And that is the 15th anniversary of September 11th. Now, you know, it was originally, we've had our entire society, our government has been restructured based on that tragedy. People really died. It's not a false flag in that sense, but it was, I believe, a false flag. Uh, two planes, three buildings collapsed in their footprint. Nobody has been sued over bad design or bad inspection. I mean, there's so many things, and we've done documentaries on it. We can't go into all the details with this. See the documentaries. However, when you look at what happened this weekend, on a, an easy jet flight in the UK, I think it shows that really nothing has changed. Our government hasn't done anything to make us safer. As a matter of fact, look at this flight where we've got a guy who is being deported from the UK to Venice, screaming, Allahu Akbar, death is coming, we all will die. Okay, let's hear that clip. Today, death is coming. Allahu Akbar. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome aboard. My name is Hello, Albert. The captain of this flight. First of all, I want to apologize for the delay. Hello, Albert. Today, there was some Today, Today we will die. The flight time is going to be closed for one hour and four minutes. The weather is marvelous. Hello, Albert. The whole room. We will die. 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 Now, that was a two-hour flight that people had to endure that. We're going to talk about what actually happened on that flight. But just think about how this illustrates the insanity that we've been faced with, the insanity of the open borders, the insanity of the refugee program, and, of course, the imaginary let's pretend security theater that the TSA and Homeland Security are. We're not any safer. America gave up its freedoms, gave up its legal structure willingly. For the promise of safety. Yet in becoming slaves, we find that we are no safer. As a matter of fact, far less safe than we were 15 years ago. What happened here? This was in the UK. And as the Daily Mail points out, holiday makers were forced to endure a terrifying two hour flight alongside a migrant who repeatedly screamed, Allahu Akbar, death is coming. It emerged the Home Office is now using budget airlines to deport illegal immigrants. Okay, he screamed Allahu Akbar 29 times, death is coming 17 times, we will all die nine times. Now, as the people got on, they said uh, this is an undeported, unidentified uh, immigrant who is being deported to Venice, okay? This is the insanity and the hatred of the people that are now being brought in. Remember, after September 11th, the Bush administration sent back the bin Laden family, the very people that they said were responsible for the terror attack in the official story. They sent them out on a plane. They said that the Saudi officials and the 28 pages that have now been released, the Saudi officials who finance people here, government diplomats, they were protected. They were sent out. So they sent out the people that they had identified as terrorists, protected them, sent them to another country so that uh, justice couldn't get to them, the American people couldn't get to them. And now what are they doing? After they've set the Middle East on fire, after they have, with their quote-unquote surgical strikes of drones that have killed thousands of innocent people, now they bring these angry people into our country. As we saw in Germany, the German government admitting that they think there's at least 500 people out of the 500,000 that would uh, commit terrorist acts in the country. That's only one out of 1,000. Of course, that's just an estimate. It could be more than one-tenth of one percent because they haven't vetted anybody. So we have a government that flew the terrorists out on September the 12th, and now they are flying them back in to unleash a jihad on us, okay? As I point out, rather than calming worried passengers, our government has no concern about us, okay? Whether or not this represented a real security threat, they had several people on this guy, they had him bound, and yet they don't care about alarming the passengers. As a matter of fact, they probably love the fact that you're afraid, that you go clamoring to them for safety. 
Rather than calming worried passengers, they say EasyJet cabin crew ordered the passengers to delete the videos and the pictures of the man that they had taken on mobile phones. Cover it up. Just like the mainstream media wants to cover up what is happening to Hillary Clinton. Covering up everything. That is the secret government, the secret surveillance state that we have created. In a bid to control the deportee, one home office official crouched on his knees facing the man with an arm on his shoulders for much of the flight. He was being deported to Italy under Dublin regulations, which dictate that people must claim asylum in the first safe country they reach. See, this is the absurdity of the bureaucracy. You want to give this guy asylum? Put him in Arkham Asylum. They said the Home Office is spending 30 million pounds a year, that's about $45 million, on returning illegal immigrants and foreign criminals to their home countries. One of the people there said, when we got on board, the seats were moving, so he's obviously kicking, thrashing. I thought someone was having a fit, but when we got up close... We can see that there were people restraining him. Really, is the government restraining terrorists? Or are they moving them around in our midst? That is a perfect metaphor. What happened on that plane is a perfect metaphor for what's happened in America. Today, before we talk about Hillary's situation and the updates on it, I want to contrast the joint, uh, the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, JASTA, that was just passed on Friday, just before the 15th anniversary of September 11th. They passed a bill to allow Americans to get some compensation from countries that have been suspected of terrorist ties. You know, the people like the Saudis that were identified by our own government. The people who came here, they say it was Saudi uh, terrorists who conducted uh, the 9-11 attack. And yet the people with the Saudi government who helped the very people that they identify... The victims of September 11th can't get any compensation for that. Isn't that interesting? And yet, at the same time, what is the other acronym that we have? We have JASTA on that side, okay? Justice Against the Sponsors of Terrorism Act, to give compensation for the victims. What do we have on the other side? Well, for 15 years, they had no problem immediately passing the authorization for the use of military force. And I understand people wanted to lash out. They wanted to get somebody. Even if they didn't get the right person, they wanted to get somebody and make them pay for the horrors of... September 11th. What is inexcusable is that for the last 15 years, the Congress has reauthorized that every single year. Thumbing their nose at the Constitution. Thumbing their nose at what they have sworn to obey. You know, every two years, members of Congress have to swear back in, swear their allegiance to the Constitution. The Senate, every six years. But every year, they come in and they pass the NDAA. They pass the AUMF. And they deny, by passing those, what they have sworn to obey, and that is the Constitution. So, on the one hand, we have them delaying restitution to the victims of 9-11 for 15 years. And on the other hand, they have given a blank check to government. You know, as one uh, Bush official pointed out, the AUMF was a Christmas tree. And they could hang anything they wanted to on it. You know, we talk all the time about the Patriot Act, about uh, the Homeland Security, the TSA, the NSA dragnet surveillance. And, of course, those are very important. But just remember that the AUMF was passed unanimously in the aftermath of September 11th in the Senate, passed unanimously. Everyone but one congresswoman in uh, the House voted for it. And they have re-upped it every year. And as they created the NDAA, indefinite detention, without trial, indefinite detention by the military, transporting you somewhere else if they feel like it. When we talked to Stuart Rhodes, a constitutional scholar, Oath Keepers, he said, look, this is all based upon the authorization of the use of military force. That gives them carte blanche to do anything that they want. Perpetual war, anywhere. And of course, who are the enemies? Anybody that they want it to be. Back in 2013, there was a congressional hearing. They came before the House and Senate Oversight Committees, and I put oversight in quotation marks. And the head of the committee said to them, uh, who are these associated groups that you keep talking about? There's nothing in the authorization for the use of military force, those magic 60 words that give you the power to do anything. There's nothing in there about associated groups. That's implied. It's like, yeah, well, um, who are they? See, not even our elected representatives, they don't even know who we are at war with, just like the no-fly lists. Nobody knows who's on the no-fly list. You don't know if you're on the no-fly list. You don't know how to get off the no-fly list. You, can't be, you cannot confront your accusers in a public trial. You can't call witnesses to defend you. 
And of course, this allows them to put any groups that they wish on this list. We don't even know who we are fighting in these secret, perpetual, eternal wars that we have going on. Here's another example of the authorization of the use of military force. Lawyers are embedded everywhere. Maybe you saw the movie uh, Eye in the Sky with Her Helen Mirren. Excellent movie if you haven't seen it about some of the conflicts that have been created in this drone war that we have uh, uh, started here, okay? You've got lawyers everywhere deciding on who the targets are going to be. Why do we need lawyers deciding who the targets are going to be? Because we don't have a clear moral imperative for the war. We don't know who we're fighting. We don't know why we're fighting these people, okay? There's something about terrorism. Terrorism is a tactic. We can't even identify clearly these people. We have lawyers picking out these targets, arguing over these targets because there's no clear moral authority. There is no legal authority to do this. The Congress has no authority to ignore the Constitution when it comes to selecting countries that you're going to fight. They fought Iraq, they fought Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, all of these have been based on the authorization of the use of military force without Congress declaring war. Now, they could have gone after individual terrorists. They could have put bounties on their heads with letters of marks and reprisals. That's in the Constitution. Ron Paul pointed that out long ago. You put those people's names out there with a large fine on it, you will get people who will turn them in. You, uh, I guarantee that. You don't have to bomb innocent villages. But they do that because they want to bring the war to America. They're bringing the immigrants to America. You can see this guy that's on the plane. That's what he's doing. So should we be able to sue other countries? The people in the, the head of the Saudi-dominated Gulf Cooperation Council is furious about this. They say it would allow Americans to sue foreign governments suspected of ties to terror attacks on U.S. soil. Yet President Barack Obama has long said he would veto the legislation, citing concerns that could usher in a torrent of similar claims abroad against the U.S. government. See, they don't want you to get compensation. They wanted a war. That's why they carried out 9-11. They wanted a war. They didn't want to protect you. They don't want to protect you after you're injured. Now, in the time we've got left, I want to quickly look at something that is a consequence of all this. And that is, of course, the awareness that we all have of the surveillance state of the NSA's dragnet surveillance. That was something, quite frankly, that was being done back in the 70s. Frank Church came after the CIA in those hearings. Congressman Pike had hearings in the House to come after the NSA, the arrogance of the NSA saying, we won't even show you our charter. We were created by executive action by President Truman. We won't even show you the charter. No, you're just a congressman. We don't answer to you. We're our own government. They were spying on people at the time, but not with the tools that they have now. And what happened after 9-11? We had patriots like William Binney, like Thomas Drake, who were in the NSA, who said, you have no constitutional authority to do what you're doing with these computers. They became whistleblowers. The government came after the whistleblowers. So we had Ed Snowden, who said, I understand what they're going to do. I understand they're going to shut me down. A man who's a patriot, and I think it's very interesting to see what Oliver Stone is saying. He said... This weekend, he said, Obama should pardon Snowden. And that's essentially the same thing Rand Paul said. Rand Paul said, hey, if you are not going to throw in prison the people in the NSA who are illegally, unconstitutionally doing dragnet surveillance, then you should pardon Snowden as well. You're going to throw him in jail? Then throw them in jail as well. And, of course, Oliver Stone also pointed out that Obama has created the most intense surveillance state in history. Absolutely true. Now, he's been talking about his movie. There's a long interview with him on Wired magazine. He had this to say. He said, uh, you're asking me if there's any distortions in the movie. Let's take some examples of how American history gets distorted in movies. Stone says, the CIA is all over Hollywood. They got the series 24. They've got Homeland. You always see the CIA as heroes. It's disgusting. They were all over Catherine Bigelow's movie, Zero Dark Thirty. I've seen the documentation and the FOIA of their involvement. They were trying to influence that script, and they did. That's, what you're ta that's where you're talking distortion. But I think even more interesting is what he had to say about Ed Snowden. He said, they asked him, they said, there's a line inspired by Ayn Rand in the film. Quote, one man can stop the motor of the world, unquote. And they asked, is Snowden a Randian? It's, Ed, uh, Oliver Stone said uh, he admired her. He was definitely libertarian in his origins. He was an admirer of Thoreau and the original Tea Party. Those men broke the law and started a revolution. Breaking the law can make sense when it's for a greater good. To me, this is the basis of the theme of the movie. A young man with an extraordinary conscience. Yes, that's what it's going to take to turn this country around. And what we've seen with Clinton is someone whose first instinct is to lie 
when something happens. She could have told the truth and it probably would have helped her. But instead she told a lie and that lie continues. And we're gonna talk in, later in the program, I'm gonna talk with Margaret Howell and Owen Schroyer and we're going to talk about, is it likely that the Democrat party will replace her? What is the mechanism for that? Will they stop the elections? If they do replace her, who would they replace her with? I think it's very important that we look at this, but I think it's also important to understand that Donald Trump has been very wise in the way that he has handled this. He's chosen not to focus on her health, but he's chosen to focus on her deplorable statements about America. The fact that she hates those who oppose her, that she demonizes them. She turns them into objects of hatred. He spoke very eloquently about that. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, September 12th, 2016. Here are top stories. Tonight, down goes Hillary. As the mainstream media and Clinton campaign struggled to convince Americans that Hillary's 9-11 collapse was perfectly normal, InfoWars examines the video evidence and declares that Hillary's health can no longer be called a conspiracy theory. Then, the religion of peace strikes again as a Muslim migrant terrifies passengers on board an easy jet flight from Venice. The captain of this flight. First of all, I want to apologize. Hello, 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 I'm Margaret Howell reporting for InfoWars.com. Well, are reporters, mainstream reporters, too scared to come on and debate Alex Jones live on the air? You know, these keyboard commandos, the anointed ones, spouting the Hillary narrative. He personally invited one of them on the show. He discusses this on air this morning. Listen to this response. Take a look. And so we sent him an email. And I'm going to start doing this every day. We're going to send emails out to the media, the so-called media. And we're going to say, hey, we disagree with you, but we'd like you to get, come on, talk about how horrible I am to my own audience. Maybe you can save some of these people. And he said, listen, I go on credible outlets. Oh, my gosh, you're so credible. Wonder how big that paycheck is over there. I probably, probably aren't even paid there at the collapsing Chicago Tribune. But you've got your little ego. Probably live with mommy. I mean, I'm sure. I mean, looking at this Rex Humkey guy probably lives with mommy. I mean, certainly he wasn't raised by a man. Because he only does what Hillary says, what mommy says. He only talks to who mommy says. I mean, the idiot thinks we want him for credibility. No, your own corporate whore media keeps saying we only have people on that agree with us. I'm trying constantly behind the scenes to get you cowards on because you're idiots. I want to get you up here and make you look like a fool, and you know that, so you don't come on. Because you're a keyboard commando. That's why the name of his column is uh, Thoughts From My Fingers. How about Thoughts From Your Butt? And it continues, Trump and the mainstreaming of dark crazies. The same talking point, dark-hearted Alex Jones. I mean, you got anything that's original in your little fop brain? Now, continuing here, yeah, how discredited am I going to be as it comes out Hillary is sicker and sicker? So that's why this works that way, dum dum. So he sends us this email back. We're very nice. We said we'd like to have you on. This is just an hour ago. He says, ha! Well, first off, I got laughed at. I'm back in junior high. I'm going to go cry to my mommy. The other kids at the playground laughed at me. Oh, boy. Ha! Huh. Oh, he, oh, that's very intellectual. Ha! Huh. A serious discussion? That's a good one. I do have some thoughts on how the Obama administration used fluoride in my toothpaste to turn me into a mindless lib zombie. But I'm saving that for a more credible outlet. 
Well, people often ask, why don't we have any opposition on? Well, guess what? Infowars, they invite them on. They even offer to pay them in some cases. Carl DeCock was reportedly offered 5000 to come on and debate Alex. He declined. Other people in the mainstream media that are spouting that Hillary narrative, people like this Rex Hupke. I thought his name was Rex Cupcake at first. It sounds like Cupcake. It's Hupke from the Chicago Tribune. He reached out. Infowars reached out to him, and uh, he responded back. Insults, hurling insults and laughter, refused to come on and debate. And we see this time and again. These mainstream reporters, they have the same narrative that they're regurgitating over and over. They're basically Hillary talking points. They don't actually want to engage in a live debate. He's just one of these examples. And InfoWars, as Alex said today, they're going to begin to reach out and tackle these reporters one-on-one -on -one that attack Alex, that attack the show, and invite them on to debate, in some cases even paying them. Uh, Alex said today 20 major publications have offered to do profiles on him, of which he declines. But again, all debates are welcome here. Globalism already exists in the United States. Sprawled out behind me is 31,708 acres of the Balcones Canyonland Wildlife Preserve. The preserve is under the authorization of the 1973 Endangered Species Act, basically an extension of the United Nations Agenda 21. Even though Austin's population grows by 110 people every day, development of this prime acreage is not permitted. And furthermore, with the United Nations recent implementation of Agenda 2030, the globalist reach is finding its way into our very neighborhoods and lives. President Obama didn't go on a tour of Asia just to be consistently insulted for being a globalist pawn. Obama was attending the G20 in Hangzhou, China, signing away the fleeting remnants of the United States sovereignty over to the globalist 2030 agenda. Among the totalitarian horror this agenda includes are mandatory vaccinations worldwide under the guidance of Bill Gates, the unleashing of GMO technology on the natural world in the guise of feeding the hungry. I mean, genetically modified sounds Frankensteinish. Drought resistance sounds really something you want. Carbon taxes that will increase poverty and create a surf-like energy consumption. An introduction of a global tax that will make the IRS and the Federal Reserve look like child's play. And a global implementation of smart grid technology that will be beta tested in Africa under the $7 billion of U.S. taxpayer money Obama donated to the project titled Power Africa. The socialist tentacles of Agenda 2030 now reach right into our own backyards. As Obama, in a last-ditch effort, aims to essentially transform America by giving the poorest of neighborhoods an equitable stake in the richest of neighborhoods. The Austin, Texas City Council is hiring, not electing, what will be known as the Chief Equity Officer. Officer. Seattle, Washington, and Portland, Oregon have already paved the way for this socialist enterprise. Three candidates are in contention for the position here in Austin, Texas. Austin Mayor Steve Adler wrote, similarly to the Sustainability Office, which has a focus on the environment, i.e. Agenda 21, we should consider the creation of an equity office, have chief equity officer, or propose an alternative that provides such a dedicated office. Such an office could advance racial and ethnic equity by looking at all the city does with a focus on equity, gathering equity data, and creating dashboards, advocating for and perhaps staffing the quality of life commissions. The work would focus on tackling institutional barriers based on race and ethnicity and addressing those issues that interfere with access and equitable service delivery. In response, Austin City Council Member Ora Houston replied, Mayor, this is a great idea. Equity is a issue of class as well as ethnicity and or culture. So we are there building and, and drawing maps and holding people accountable. I think equity means that we announce the sense of a system that was created for us and start looking at how do we build our own systems the way that works for the community that's screaming that we need equity. One of the um, things that we see as being really effective across the country is use of a racial equity tool. And what that means is that when decisions are being made, that we are 
that are in race in the impacts, whether the decision is actively perpetuating the status quo or working to change the status quo. The history of change in the United States is the history of organizing. And the reason why we have had change is because of community organizing, putting pressure on government. The main goal of the micromanagement of communities cloaked in the disguise of diversity is to eventually break communities down into sustainable megacities, a one world system that will follow the implementation of the United Nations Strong Cities Network, replacing our local police forces, the watering down or complete elimination of the Second Amendment under the enforcement of Secretary of State John Kerry's signing of the Small Arms Treaty and an engineered global depression. United Nations manipulation of the human population has become a very stark reality. A reality you won't be hearing about from the mainstream media until it's too late. John Bound for Infowars.com. Right now on Infowars.com. Hillary campaign says that everyone has been sick and that Hillary just has a case of pneumonia. If you're 70 years old and you have pneumonia, that is a serious issue. You should not be getting dragged about the United States of America for a presidential campaign. That is not right. Ethically, who's ever running her campaign, if she has pneumonia, needs to be looked at that she's still being forced to do this. But pneumonia is just on a long list of things. What about the seizures? I guess that explains the coughing. But what about the strokes, the brain surgery, all the other proof of neurological disorders, the Parkinson's medication? What is really going on with Hillary Clinton? But Steve Watson is pointing out the fact that her campaign is now blaming pneumonia. That is on Infowars.com. Welcome back. Joining me now are Margaret Howell and Owen Schroyer. We're going to talk about what will happen if Hillary is removed or if she drops out for medical reasons. We have an article by Paul Joseph Watson asking, could the election be suspended if Hillary Clinton drops out? What will be the role of the Electoral College? But I think more importantly, what would be the role of the Democrat Party? Of course, they could appoint whoever they wish. We're going to talk about who they might appoint. They'd have an opportunity to appoint a clean slate candidate, essentially somebody who has not been attacked for decades or at least for the last year very heavily. Pretty much anybody that they could put in would uh, be more electable, says uh, Cokie Roberts. She said that today on NPR. She said there's a, a movement within the Democrat Party saying uh, anybody could do better against Donald Trump than Hillary Clinton. So there's some people apparently who are very anxious to have her replaced. Do you think that's likely? And if so, who do you think would do that? Well, it's amazing that uh, they're finally breaking rank. You know, she was supposedly indestructible. Turns out, you know, even they're admitting that she's one of the most hated candidates in U.S. history. You know, nobody likes her, even her own party. But conveniently, David... Would you say she's deplorable? There, she's deplorable. Yeah. It, can <laughs> it be. definitely is after this weekend, yeah. <laughs> she, conveniently, this is happening um, when the news of her, you know, she's knocking on death's door at the same time. You know, oh, by the way, yeah, we hate her too, but she also might be dead in a month, so... Maybe. Well, you know, it was... It was uh, <laughs> Just about uh, three days ago, uh, that uh, there was every they were pouring cold water on any discussion of her health. That was a conspiracy theory, of course. Rachel Maddow uh, picking that moment to attack Infowars for discussing and the concerns, concerns about her health, and yet now that's all they can talk about. So, is it likely that they're going to put somebody else in? And, and who do you think would be the most likely people that they would well, uh, take? Well, I, I think it's funny. Before we get to that, how we've seen the mainstream media's talking points get spun on their head. Clearly, Hillary is obviously unhealthy. And if we remember, they were saying that Trump could never beat Clinton. There's no chance. We can't put Donald Trump in there. He can't beat Clinton. That's being proven wrong again. The Democrats are realizing that. Personally, I don't see them going with anyone else other than Hillary. Hillary is the one they wanted. They put her in this position. They knew her health was bad. If they wanted someone else, they would have already done it. Now it's almost too little too late. Unless, as Paul Joseph Watson pointed out in his article, you know, she falls off the table or whatever happens, and then they scrap the election. They either give it to Obama mm -hmm. or, as he points out, the Electoral College just goes ahead and puts a candidate in without having any voting. I think that's probably more likely than them putting another candidate in there right now. 
I don't think actually. Now he quotes uh, U.S. News and World Report for saying the Electoral College could choose the next president without an election. I don't think that can happen. My understanding of the Constitution is that the Electoral College is chosen on the basis of the election. It's a winner-take-all state by state. Mm -hmm. Each candidate, each party has a slate of electors that will go to the Electoral College if that candidate wins a state election. So I don't think that they would know who they could send as electoral. Each party has a, its own slate of electors. Like, for example, in North Carolina, it used to be 12 uh, matches the number of congressmen that they had. So they had 12 electors for each of the political parties that was on the ballot. So they wouldn't know which ones to send. They would have to have an election. But I think in terms of whether or not it's likely... Just remember that it was, what, maybe a month ago that all the Democrat talking heads, mainstream media were saying, the Republicans are just going to have to get rid of Donald Trump. That's all there is to it, that, you know, these guys, we want them to win, so we want them to get another candidate besides Donald Trump. I don't think they're going to get Hillary Clinton out of there as long as she's breathing. Right. I don't think she will give this thing up. She is too ambitious. She has wanted this all of her life. And quite frankly, folks, if you want to punish Hillary Clinton for her crimes, for what she did uh, in so yeah, many different yeah. areas, whether it's Benghazi, <laughs> whether it's the email scandal uh, exposing all of our security issues, if you want to get even with her, we're not going to send her to prison, but you can keep her out of the White House. That would essentially kill her. Mm -hmm. Okay, that be, she is so ambitious, has wanted this so much, she will not give up unless she's if she's still breathing. Even if she dies the very next day that she's in office. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> she's going for the Guinness Book of Records. Okay, as long as she can check off the mark and say, "I was the first woman elected," right. she can die happy. So don't let that happen. Okay, <laughs> but. <laughs> let's just go with a theoretical, let's go with a theoretical, if, <laughs> if they were to remove her, or if she were to drop dead, okay, and, and not physically be able to do it, if it became so bad, who do you think, the Democrats, of course, can pick somebody else to go in there, the party itself, who do you think they would pick? Possibly Michelle Obama, she's been vetted, she was offered a, you know, Chicago Senate seat, she, you know, obviously is a part of the administration, she has the woman factor, kind of, I'm not sure really, but that would be one possibility. Also, Terry McAuliffe, he paid Hillary Clinton this massive favor, favor by allowing uh, convicted felons to vote in the upcoming election. You know, this this was lifted in his state. He's a possibility. But honestly, I'm, I'm with you, David, in the theory that she's going to possibly die in office, just push herself on through. You can imagine, though, the crisis mode that the DNC and their strategists are in right now if she does die before the election, you know, who, who are they going to prop up? Who are they going to find? Um, and let's hope that they don't find a viable what do you think, Evan? Well, everybody, put in? everybody seems to think that the leading candidates are Tim Kaine, Joe Biden, and Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. uh, I would agree with you that. Know, Kaine, obviously, the vice presidential candidate, would be the one that would step in. He mm -hmm. seems like a perfect stalking horse for the Democrats. But the whole thing with Bernie Sanders, you know, I, I think that Bernie Sanders has already bowed out. You know, he bought his brand new vacation home. He allegedly bought a new Audi that he's traveling around in. So <laughs> to me, Bernie Sanders is already out of the picture. He played his role. He was a stalking horse. And now he's done. He's out. He's already vacationing. Plus, he's an independent. He's no longer a Democrat. He went right. back to being an independent. Right. So I don't think he's an option. Yeah, the Democratic establishment never really liked uh, Bernie. He was never one of them. Yeah. And you know what? Bernie and Biden are both older than Hillary. Now, that may or may not be a factor. But I, I tend to believe that it would be Kane. And that is very troubling because of his background. Mm -hmm. Because this guy comes from a liberation theology Jesuit background, which was, as we pointed out earlier today, as Drudge has a link to the Coming story. To yeah, it, it, you know, he was involved in, back in the 80s when we had the uh, move by the Soviet Union within Central America, South America, the Nicaraguan uh, issues and everything. He was there with the revolutionary priests who were actually taking up arms and fighting people. He sought those people out. And yet then he turns around and becomes one of the founding members of the Million Moms Against Firearms. Because this is the way these people always roll. Hillary Clinton, who arms ISIS... <laughs> okay, creates a, an arms bazaar in Benghazi, who uh, these these Democrats who create fast and furious to destroy the Second Amendment, they're the ones who want to take your weapons here domestically. They have these schizophrenic policies when it comes to their real position. The problem with that is, and I agree with you on some aspects of the David, but nobody knows who the hell this guy is. It's like, who who are you exactly? You know, he comes out of nowhere. I mean, obviously people in Virginia know who he is, but it's just like he doesn't have that national... I'm not That's so what they would like. Right. I think that they, you know, you've got a situation where Hillary has been attacked for over a year. Okay, hard and heavy. People are bringing back her her old history for who didn't know it. She's been out of the limelight. You've got Donald Trump, who's been attacked by a large field of Republican candidates for a very long time. So their negatives are very high. They could bring in a candidate who has a clean slate, mm -hmm. and there is no time left for us to vet them to expose them, to really do it, investigate who is this person, okay? They could just bring this person in 
and everybody would just, hey, this is great. This is a fresh new face. And, and wouldn't that be incredible to actually witness that where it almost seems like perfectly planned where Hillary Clinton, you know, she has all this favoritism running in. Then the year goes by, you know, she faints, she coughs, all the scandals come out. She's she's deplorable. She's dropping in the polls. And then somehow magically she still gets elected and then she dies and Tim Kaine comes in. It would almost exactly. be like the perfect storm for the Democrats, almost as if that's what they want. I mean, you know, I, I don't know exactly how much they knew about how sick Hillary was, if she had a date, you know, you know, I, you know, I don't know any of that, but. They knew she was sick. Yeah. They knew her history. They knew that she couldn't beat Donald Trump. Infowars has been saying it the whole time. Mm -hmm. So now it's, did they already plan on replacing her? Or are they shuffling the deck saying, well, we have to do something now. She's unelectable. I don't know. Now is the time for us to begin vetting Tim Kaine. Okay, he may be the VP, but as we can see with Hillary's health issues, the VP could be very, very important. If she gets uh, wins the election, he may be president very shortly after that. If she can't make it to the election because of health issues, and again, she's not going to drop out. She's not going to let anybody take her off the ballot as long as she's breathing, okay? But if she's not and he becomes a candidate, I think the most likely person would be uh, Tim Kaine. We need to start looking at this guy right now and understanding who he is. I think that is a very important thing for us to understand. And real quick, I think that the Democrat constituents need to ask themselves, are we really about to elect a person that has to be placed in a van that goes limp and has to be picked up and placed in a van? I, I'm surprised that the Democrat constituents aren't raising more an issue with this. You talk about how shameless her Secret Service is. I mean, deny, 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 deny till you die. What up. kind of a philo your philosophy of life is that? You know, you think that there would be some some semblance of honesty at this point, just a shred. No, no, it has shown exactly who and what she <laughs> is. It's the same thing we saw with Benghazi. Remember, they gave us a ridiculous narrative and continued that even after it was exposed to be false that's precisely the way they've reacted this time well that's all the time that we have for the infowars nightly news tonight join us again tomorrow at 7 central 8 p.m eastern for the infowars nightly news we we are in an information war and we are losing that war um do you also know that hillary clinton uses a wheelchair her personal vehicle has had to be outfitted with a wheelchair lift because she is not a person who can actually walk. She secretly uses a wheelchair all those times you think you've seen her walking. She hasn't been walking. Did you know that? Did you also know that Hillary Clinton has Parkinson's disease? No, it's, it, these things are true. I know they are true because I read them in the headlines. Here, I will prove it to you. Uh, here was the shock headline on Hillary Clinton's wheelchair vehicle. Uh, just one column over from that, there was also this seem seemingly competing news. Uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, d does Hillary Clinton have Parkinson's disease? The subhead there, we can all see she has some very serious health problems. And our, our private media cannot fill that gap. Uh, the media spinning lies and misinformation to try to get us off of that hot button that we're on. So... Well, exactly. Watson's got an article out today just how the Clinton campaign is really pushing for the media to blatantly cover up, lie, anything. They do not want to touch this Hillary's health. They think this could have the potential to derail her entire campaign. From Hillary Clinton, he says she was standing on a curb with a protective detail waiting for her motorcade. Uh, they were surprised to see her because she wasn't supposed to be leaving yet, so they had to wait for the motorcade two or three minutes. When it finally rolled up, my source says she stumbled off the curb, appeared to faint, lost one of her shoes that wound up underneath the van. Uh, her protective detail, I'm told, helped her into that van, and then the van took off, presumably in the direction of a hospital. They grabbed her shoe and flagged down her the rest of her detail. Her shoe was given to that detail who, who was following the other two vehicles and they left uh, ground zero early uh, just moments ago because of some apparent medical episode that Hillary Clinton was suffering. It Extremely humid temperatures. She was adorned in a, a long sleeved coat, uh, a, a pantsuit. And so what we will see here now is her getting into the car. She was a little bit unstable there. She was a, a little bit wobbly. That's, I think, an appropriate word to use. You could see right there. Again, she had become overheated. I couldn't even wear what I'm wearing now to be appropriately dressed to anchor a broadcast. It's not terribly hot today, John. Uh, it was warm. 
certainly warm and warm at the scene. Uh, but again, Hillary Clinton, my source, was 15 feet away, says she appeared to be having some sort of medical episode. She has an unbelievably challenging taxing schedule that would be so physically for anybody, mm -hmm. right? Let alone somebody. Um, yeah. Look, this was so botched. This was so mishandled. Uh, the whole issue of transparency. And this only reinforces uh, all the, the conspiracy theories. You know, why is it that an advanced and fairly well-educated country like ours is nevertheless getting to be as susceptible to political conspiracy theories as broadly uneducated countries in faraway lands? Oh, you okay. Keep talking, you handle it, we're not going anywhere. Okay, here we are. But there's nothing wrong with her. I'm out on the campaign with her, aside from that cough. She has more energy than I do, or half the press corps, which is a lot younger than her, the rest of the press corps. But the fact is that they have only made things worse. Because what happened? It's a beautiful day in New York. <coughs> Sorry. Is that your cough? Yeah. Why is it that we get more and more susceptible conspiracy theories as susceptible conspiracy theories as time goes on? We don't seem like the kind of country where they would have as much traction as they do now in our contemporary era in politics. Part of the reason why we're so susceptible to conspiracy theories right now is that guys like Alex Jones make a ton of money circulating them as widely as they possibly can. They use multiple platforms. They use talk radio and the internet and they live stream their kind of fake TV shows and they make a very good living doing it. And they're going to be around because of it for a long time. And usually this kind of stuff has no major effect on the United States of America other than lowering our median IQ a couple of points and making us seem slightly more embarrassing on an international stage. Right? For every additional year they circulate their insane alien lizard people theories of everything, we get a little bit dumber. And that's the major effect it has on the United States of America. But this year is different. And then the secrecy yesterday, and for an hour and a half, the press corps, uh, the protective press pool, the pool of reporters, which is supposed to be with her just for this kind of emergency, they are kept back at the ceremonies. They don't know that she is, they're not told that she's gone to Chelsea's apartment. Right. Then they're brought there so that we can see her coming out looking very spry. Yeah, what's happened? It's a beautiful day in New York. Hugging the little girl. And then, eight hours after this first happened, they finally tell us about mm. the diagnosis of pneumonia that, was, that occurred on Friday. I'm sorry. There is an obligation. Hillary Clinton took a nasty fall as she boarded her plane yesterday. Clinton was leaving Yemen for the next stop on her Mideast tour, Oman. Secretary of State is okay this morning. Owen Schroyer from Infowars.com. And I am reporting on the Barack Obama administration now going 15% over their goal of Syrian refugees for the 2016 fiscal year. Now, this is covered on CNSNews.com. 11,491 Syrian refugees have been admitted already during this fiscal year. And that is 15% over the target of the Obama administration. Now, before we get into some of the numbers of of these refugees being admitted into the United States, let's think about how quickly we've forgotten. Now, yesterday was 9-11, and of course, on 9-11, the slogan is, never forget. But isn't it, isn't it strange how here we are in 2016, 15 years later, and somehow we have forgotten what happened on 9-11-2001, or perhaps we've just kind of been bamboozled into not accepting what did happen, or we're supposed to just forget that it was radical Islamic terror and an attack on our way of life on that day. So it's amazing to me that on 9-11-2001, we're told that radical Islamic terrorists took down the Twin Towers and the Pentagon and had other plans to take down buildings and crash planes. And it was radical Islamic terror against our way of life. So 
Are we fighting a war on terror? Are we fighting a war against radical Islam? Are we fighting a war on religions that are against and attacking our way of life? What is it we are fighting? And why do we say never forget and then allow over 10,000 refugees from the Middle East who are Islamic into our country? It's just fishy. It just doesn't add up more than anything uh, what's going on. Is this the establishment? kind of hoping we accept the fact that 9-11 was an inside job and we're, we shouldn't blame Islamic terror for attacking our way of life? Or is that what happened? Isn't it amazing how there is such a stark difference between the Bush administration and the Obama administration on how we remember or forget the events of 9-11? But I digress. Let's get into the actual numbers of what's going on. With three weeks left to go in this fiscal year, Barack Obama has now accepted more than 15% of his target goal of Syrian refugees. This is over 11,000 people that have now been accepted into this country. A new monthly record was set last month of over 3,000 refugees coming in. 751 so far in September, 749 of which are Muslims and then two Christians. Now, the true discrimination in the Middle East is against Christians. So why is it just 54 of the over 11,000 Syrian refugees admitted into this country have been Christians? They are the ones under attack. So we, we have to start asking questions there. That doesn't add up. Now, this is very important. In the 1951 Refugee Convention, persecution on the grounds of religion is one of five criteria for determining whether an applicant should be granted refugee status. The other is race, nationality, political opinion, and membership of a social group. We did this so we could only bring in people who want to assimilate, who believe in America, and want to come here and build this country. Not people who want to come here and tear it down. Not people who want to come here and attack our way of life.